What is the future of war? Today, we meet the men who ran the Pentagon's Unit X and led the charge to get Silicon Valley technology into the hands of frontline soldiers, but faced extraordinary resistance from the Pentagon's old guard. Just inside a tank on our way into Gaza, there is just rubble and destruction as far as you can see. They're digging in their positions, they're practicing. Point accuracy over target is what has transformed so much of this conflict. This is World at War. I'm The Sun's defence editor, Jerome Starkey, and joining me down the line today are Christopher Kirchhoff from New York and Raj M. Shah from Washington, who together ran the Pentagon's Defence Innovation Unit in Silicon Valley and have written about that experience in an extraordinary book, Unit X. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. My first question, what is the future of war? Thank you, Jerome. Uh, we're just at this extraordinary moment, and you see it in Ukraine, uh, not only with drones, but, you know, in the last month, uh, the Ukrainians have actually had to evacuate from the front lines all the 31 advanced M1A1 tanks the U.S. has provided them, because a quarter of them were uh, uh, destroyed by Russian kamikaze drones. And that tells people like me and Raj that a century of man-mechanized warfare is coming to an end that uh, that is how fast uh, the pace of change is evolving on, on the battlefield. And you don't just see it in Ukraine. If you wander over to the Middle East and uh, look at what's happening there, you know, you have Hamas able to uh, invade Israel on October 7th by using quadcopters to destroy uh, the generators on the Israeli border towers. You now have Hezbollah using loitering munitions that uh, have effectively depopulated the north of Israel. The uh, Israelis have had to evacuate 85,000 civilians because they can't effectively defend the northern border. And then if you move over to the Red Sea, the Houthi rebels are now threatening 12% of global shipping by using autonomous sea drones. So we're seeing just a sea change, a literal sea change in the kind of technology that is today used on the battlefield. But do you think, and this is a conversation we have quite a lot uh, about the whether legacy platforms will survive. I mean, you talk about the end of armored warfare. Um, we often ask the question, is the main battle tank dead? I mean, you seem to be suggesting that the answer could be yes, although in the book you talk about the combination uh, a bit of legacy platforms and the enabling power of drones to make those platforms uh, more uh, effective. Do you think there is there still a place for the M1 Abrams in battles like Ukraine? I mean, Jeremy, Jerome, for, for sure, there definitely is a place. Uh, as we talk about in the book, we're in this fascinating era of hybrid war where you have legacy weapon systems operating alongside uh, new digital technologies, whether it's Starlink or command and control runoff smartphones. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the reason why you see these two different uh, kinds of technology working together is that there are literally two different systems of technological production in our world today. One for the military, producing a lot of the legacy systems you still see on the battlefield, and one system that produces everything else. And the two are very different. And uh, the whole goal of our effort in starting uh, the Pentagon Silicon Valley office is to try and bring those two ecosystems closer together. And that's what you're seeing today on the battlefield in Ukraine. And do you think the role of Silicon Valley is going to get more and more important? I mean, the, the, it's, it's still the big defense primes that manufacture the warships that manufacture the tanks, the self-propelled howitzers, the guns. But as we've seen in Ukraine, actually, it's the startups, it's uh, cottage industries almost, which are producing uh, these transformative weapons uh, in many cases. Yeah, Jerome, I think that's a, a very insightful area. Silicon Valley uh, and places like the Valley will have a really big role. And why is that? Uh, you know, there's a couple trends. One is how important software is to defense, uh, and just everything we do in our daily lives. If you look at the F-35, the latest uh, stealth fighter jet that is you know, uh, being procured across uh, NATO and US allies, uh, it's basically a flying computer and the software behind it is vital. And if you think about where is the best software built, where are the best engineers going, they're going to large Silicon Valley based companies that are serving a huge market. In fact, if you look at the market caps of Apple, Nvidia, Microsoft, each one is 3x the entirety of the defense industrial base combined. So we need to go to where the energy, the engineering is, 
on so the software side, as well as we think about low cost hardware, right? Really cheap drones, really cheap hardware from your, your phones to, to quadcopters. And so we're in this unique kind of moment in time, again, where the defense agencies of the world are not a sole monopsony buyer, right? They're not just the biggest dogs in the fight. They need to work with commercial companies. And I think that has always been a challenge. It's culturally different from the type of people, the processes, and that's what Chris and I uh, endeavored to do uh, with the support of Secretary Carter. I mean, this was his vision. Interestingly, he wrote a paper in 2001 predicting the importance of how uh, software and commercial technology, AI before it was called AI and cybersecurity is going to be important. And then 15 years later, when he became Secretary of Defense, he set that up uh, and gave us the charge to, to try to bring those worlds together. And uh, you know, I'm proud to say 10 years later, they've never been closer. And so you've had a ringside seat, both of you, looking at what Silicon Valley can bring to the table in terms of defense technology. From your point of view, what are the most exciting areas? Because, of course, in one sense, we're seeing the future of war playing out uh, in real time in Ukraine. But if you were to look another 10 years, 15 years uh, into the future, and I know we haven't quite come up with a technology that can see into the future yet, but, but where do you think uh, conflict and where do you think technology is, is going to take conflicts of the future? Well, well I think right there's now, a couple areas, and I'll turn it over to, to, to Chris. I mean, one is a, a, a flying car a company called Joby that's using a electric VTOL uh, aircraft that uh, can, can fly autonomously. Uh, we had the pleasure of helping get the first one built for the US, uh, the US Air Force. Um, and then there's a, a myriad of software things, right? Decision science. How do you cut through the fog of war? And these are things that we're seeing now. And Christopher? Well, it's, it's really exciting. I mean, uh, you're seeing now such rapid developments with autonomy. And I think if we think about the mega trends in technology, autonomy is certainly one of them, but AI is another. And I think we're only at the very beginning of those two trends coming together. And you can start to see it now on the battlefield in Ukraine and some of the incredible advances uh, in how smart some of the drone systems are getting at being able to maneuver autonomously, identify targets anonymously, uh, uh, fight through denied airspace against very sophisticated Russian electronic warfare systems. So those two trends coming together, I think, are going to fuel the kind of technology that will make the difference on the battlefield in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. And is that humans being taken out of the loop? So, so robots, computers making decisions over when to employ lethal force? Well, today, the Pentagon has been very clear. It has an explicit policy that states uh, for any sort of lethal force, you need to have a human in the loop. But of course, uh, as AI advances, uh, this is going to press, pressurize uh, that commitment. And it could be um, that uh, different, whole different ways of approaching what we allow autonomous system, systems to do um, uh, are, is the way to, to be most effective on the battlefield. But we haven't quite crossed that point yet. I mean, Raj, perhaps do you foresee a time when computers will be more reliable? I mean, uh, for, the, for the viewers who don't know, Raj, you were a, a US Air Force pilot, uh, and that was part of your journey to where you are now. Do you foresee a time where technology might actually be a, a more reliable arbiter of what constitutes a valid military target than a human being, be it a pilot or a weapons engineer? Uh, should we, should we sure. be relying on computers? Yeah, Jerome, it's, it's really interesting. You know, I think as we think between tactical and strategic, uh, we have to use different lens. So tactically, does it make sense to send a robot where instead of a human and putting a human at risk? I mean, I think that is uh, patently obvious in the way we're moving from uh, air drones, sea drone, underwater drones. I think the, the challenging question then becomes at what level do we allow strategic decision making to be pushed down to a robot? Right, so uh, war, unfortunately, is still a human condition, uh, and there's people at the other end and both sides. So the ultimate decision to go war clearly is a is a human one. Um, but then, is there wh where does that line fall? Is it commander's intent that I want you know X of these tanks to go away and you let the robots figure it out, or does each individual decision to attack a tank become uh, a a uh, human decision. And I think we're wrestling with it, as Chris said, and that line was going to shift over time. And interestingly, you know, the adversaries don't play by your rules necessarily. So if you have an adversary that has a different set of rules, 
How do we then respond? It's going to be you know, fascinating to see this unfold. Two quick questions before we go. The first is swarms of drones. Uh, one of the people you spoke to in, in the book talks about um, uh, swarms of drones like flocks of starlings. Uh, we've seen drones collaborating cooperatively, uh, different platforms sharing information in Ukraine, but we haven't seen that, as far as I'm aware, haven't seen that, that swarm effect uh, yet. Is that, uh, has that been fielded or is that coming soon? Well, I'd say that's very much a, a V2.0 that's presently being developed, uh, not only in Ukraine by the uh, hundreds of uh, impressive companies that are innovating every day there that are native to Ukraine, uh, but also, you know, the United States Department of Defense has launched uh, with Defense Innovation Unit uh, in the lead, the Replicator Initiative, which is indeed an attempt to try and build intelligent uh, swarming autonomous systems. So I think we are just on the verge of seeing um, uh, incredible intelligence in, uh, evolving in our autonomous systems. Uh, thank you. And Raj, back to you for the final question. Given what you were just saying, do you think a future conflict uh, might involve, the, you know, certainly the first phase of that conflict might just be uh, robots against robots then. So autonomous, for example, autonomous tanks being taken out by autonomous drones. Is that the direction we're moving in? And if that is the case, what role do humans play? Yeah, again, fa fascinating topic. I do think that's going to happen, right? Uh, again, if you cannot put human lives at risk, that's better. And so then the fear is, does it make the decision to go to war and to use conflict to solve policy means versus diplomacy more easier for a leader to engage in. And I think these, again, have structural structural questions. But, you know, look, war is, a, for long as it's been in it, a terrible thing, and one that you want to deter and avoid. And I think if uh, uh, robots can reduce the, the level of harm, that's a, that's a good progression that, uh, that the world is going under. Christopher, uh, Raj, thank you very much for joining me from New York and Washington, D.C., respectively. Uh, I'm The Sun's defence editor, Jerome Starkey, and if you're watching this on YouTube and you have any questions for me, Raj or Christopher, please ask them in the comments below and we will try to answer them next week. I would recommend go out and get their book, Unit X, an excellent read.